I, th- I think a lot. There's a lot of um, uh, desire on the part of patients to avoid operations when they have something like severe stenosis. And uh, have you heard of this new procedure called the mild procedure? I have minimally invasive lumbar decompression. M- mild procedure is a lot of pain specialists are offering it. They're offering it because it's a way of avoiding surgery and having a tiny little incision to try to accomplish what we're trying to accomplish essentially by removing that thickened ligament that's part of the uh, condition of spinal stenosis that's off that that's often found. Now uh, we recently had a patient who was an 85 year old woman, right, who was trying to avoid surgery because of her age. And we did everything we could to avoid and, surgery. And she had had multiple epidural steroid injections, and her pain specialist offered her the mild procedure, which she underwent, but it did absolutely nothing to alleviate her pain. Um, and we actually ended up taking her to the operating room uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And um, what did you find? Did you find any evidence of the mild procedure? Um, I, you know, I mean, that was a in- very interesting case. That was an 85-year-old woman who was actually in very good shape. And, and generally, we don't love to tell patients in their 80s, hey, you need spine surgery. She I mean, told us. People, she she told us what, we're, what she's getting. I mean, <laughs> because right. these, these people now are living well into their 90s and over that, and they're demanding, and they want they want to live their lives. And rightfully so. And, and there's no reason why they shouldn't. And if they're healthy, and a lot of these people are healthy because they've lived, obviously, into to their 80s, they've made it, essentially, um, you feel bad about not helping them when you know you can help them despite their age. Now, age is she was, a big, she, was, she was otherwise pretty healthy. She, she was a healthy woman. She was yeah. just on vitamins. Yeah. Um, so she had the thickest ligament, this thick, thick ligament that formed, I think it was the L3-4 segment. That's right. And she had terrible pain down her thighs. She was really, she was miserable, right? She Debilitated. She, couldn't walk more than a block. And, you know, I mean, this, this woman is healthy. She wants to walk more in the block. You know, yeah. she, she needs to walk more in the block. So, she's going to go shopping. She's going to take care of herself. So she tried this procedure, which is, which is basically a way of removing some of the ligament, the bulk of the ligament, to relieve the central, what really is a central canal stenosis. You really can't do much for the sides where the, li- where the nerve roots come out of, which is called lateral recess stenosis. So it's really only for central stenosis, the mild procedure? It's really for central stenosis. They have some tools that allow you to remove some of the bone. You're doing this blindly, which I have a problem with. Under fluoroscopy. Right? You're doing under fluoroscopy. You, you basically, you give some dye to know what space you're in, to make sure you're not basically below a certain point because you don't obviously want to be near the dura. But her canal was totally crushed. I mean, she had maybe a couple millimeters of uh, I, I, she had, she I mean, had, it was all she, it was all ligament. She had layers it. upon layers upon layers of, of this yellow, thick material that developed, obviously, over 60 years. And, you know, I don't see how a mild procedure could even make a den that. They, they give you some tools. You can, you, can, you can mine a little bit of the ligament to get rid of some of the bulk. But she needed her bulk removed. And also what also prevents people from re- getting relief from a decompression of their stenosis is not only do you decompress the central canal, but you also decompress the side part where the nerve root descends and exits. That's getting picked off as well. That's called lateral recess stenosis, and it doesn't address, address that because when you do a decompression, you need to not only decompress the central but you need to do something we call a foraminotomy or a removal of that side stenosis right. to relieve the nerve. And that procedure doesn't do that. It doesn't address that. So we encountered this tremendously thick ligament that was easily dissected from the membrane, which I was surprised at. And it was actually a fun procedure because we were able to just remove these beautiful, massive pieces of ligament. Yeah. The, you know, maybe the mild procedure is best for mild stenosis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably it. Certainly, mildly did not help. It did, it did, help did not her, help her at all. Did not help her. Not even in the mild. She's sense. lucky. She's lucky. She didn't get a CSF leak. Well, that's a complication of the mild. I mean, it's a complication of what we can do too, obviously. But it's but but it's direct visualization. I guess in a mild procedure, if they get a leak, because there's no dead space created, they can get they can get away with it probably to a certain degree without yeah. leaking through the skin. Um, I guess for certain people, it's it, it, in a select group of people, it's probably. I mean, they've done, done some studies. They actually had some good results with it. I think it's probably not a terrible thing, but I think ultimately for this case, she really needed a direct decompression, which took an hour. Yeah, it didn't take long at all. We were we were pleasantly surprised at how the ease of removing that ligament from the uh, underlying dura. 
Um, Sometimes these older people really have the thinnest, floppiest membrane of the dura, which really, you know, obviously you're, 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 you're very worried about getting a, a tear in that membrane. This lady had a pretty tough, uh, tough dura. It was actually uh, nice to she see She was that. healthy. She was healthy. You know, I, think, I think people as they get older, especially women, are more likely to get osteoporosis. And, and osteoporosis, even though it's affecting the bone, can affect the collagen and the soft tissues as well, which is the lining of the dura. And the and dura the is sac, collagen. That's collagen. And so, and so when you have a decent uh, bone density, usually those patients have a decently thickened um, dural membrane. You know, patients with very bad osteoporosis usually have the worst, thinnest, saran-like dura that is floppy and... Uh, it's miserable. And we're always and in, the, scary. Uh, we're in the operating room. Not scary, but not fun. So, the, so basically the way concerned. we address that situation is we're very careful about what we call dissecting the tissue from, that we have to remove from that membrane and making sure every time we want to bite away that material that we're clear. And we just, every, every single time we make any maneuver, we always check with each other. Are we okay? Am I okay? And, and that's the way to accomplish that yeah. sort of thing. You've got, you got to work as a team. You've got to work as a team, and that's the way we work. Yeah, that's, and that's, you know, comes years of, uh, we've been together, what, two, over 20 years now. It's amazing, isn't it? It's, some marriages haven't lasted as long. I, I, I've been with you almost as long as I've been married. Which is an, an accomplishment in itself, you know. Yes, yes. We're now, like, we're like a, oh, our, uh, we're spine bros. We're spine bros. So uh, we have some time left. Do we have any more interesting cases that we've done lately that we want to talk about? How about that guy with the uh, epidural, epidural uh, uh, the epidural, epidural lipomatosis. lipomatosis? That was very interesting. Right. So we recently had a, he was a 53-year-old gentleman who came into the office complaining of severe bilateral leg pain. He was going down both legs. He had... Uh, uh, been seen by a pain specialist before he came to see us. An MRI had shown that he had uh, some congenital stenosis, but superimposed on that was what they called epidural lipomatosis. And lipo like, like we discussed earlier, you know, medicine is just a different language so that we can talk to each other. Um, so it was just fat in the canal, basically. Fat in the canal. A lot of too fat much in the fat. canal. Too much fat in the canal. And this was not, he, was, this? He, was, he was a skinny guy. He was not a fat man at all. Right. There's, it has no correlation. No. Of getting this he was material, not obese. Uh, you know, your body habitus does not dictate whether you do or do not get this condition. Correct. Correct. And and you know, it's just the abundant. You know, normally there is uh, there's some fat. Normally there's fat in the epidural space. That's normal. The blood vessels run through the fat. Yeah. You you know, when we do a decompression, oftentimes we know that the decompression is ended when we start seeing uh, fat. Fat. Right. Because when you're basically the person is really stenotic, the fat goes away. Correct. Basically. The fat's being squeezed out by the ligament. So we basically decompress from fat to fat. Yes, but in this case, the fat, there was an, an abundance of the uh, epidural fat and was causing compression. Right, because the spine, the canal is basically is surrounded by a bony ring and anything taking up mass, which still fat takes up mass, will cause compression of that, um, that sack of nerves. So it's very soft. He, he had undergone multiple epidural steroid injections was not relieved whatsoever, was developing increasing numbness and some weakness in his legs. And um, what's interesting about him is that he had what they call a transitional segment. Do you know what that is? Uh, the transitional segment is when one of the vertebrae looks like it wants to be something else. <laughs> and this is, is develops it, in utero. Well, sometimes people have an extra lumbar vertebra. They'll have six lumbar vertebra. But when the... Uh, or. You know, when, we, when we're in the operating room, we, don't, we just count from the bottom up. Right. So we have to make so, sure we know what we're talking about versus what the radiologist might call, for instance, L5. They may call it S1. So we have to know what we're talking right. about. Um, in this case, it was we, we had that situation, but we knew where we had to go. And we basically always check with x-ray before we, we start our decompression to know what level we are, we are at. Right. There has to be consistency in what, in what the radiologist perceives and what... And what we see. So oftentimes I'll get a plain x-ray in the office to see what, you know, what level correlates with what the radiologist is interpreting as, you know, the L4-5 level versus the L5-S1 level. And oftentimes we'll disagree, you know, and in the radiologist's defense, they're counting from C2, the top of the spine, all the way down. And they'll say, well, you know, technically this is not L, this is a transitional segment and this is actually S1, L5-S1. Um, with a, with a uh, sacralized uh, lum uh, lumbar vertebra. Right, or vice versa. In other words, the lumbar vertebra looks like it actually almost looks more like sacrum, but there is a disc still. There's some other times it's a rudimentary disc. It's right. not a real motion segment. And, and if we were to look at that on the on, on a plain film, we would think no, but that's really L5 S1 is the level below that. 
So we, we, we can misnumber or, or have a disagreement regarding the numbering of the, uh, of the spinal levels. But it's what's, a, what's really important, though, is making sure that you, that you we, know what you are doing. Where the compression is and you're doing the correct level where the compression is. Right, exactly. It's just a matter of, you know, terminology and sem- semantics. It's, the important thing is to knowing which segment is, has the pathology and you're addressing it at that level. Right. So this guy had this very interesting uh, – it's actually the color of the fat for epidural lipomatosis is a different color than regular fat. It's sort of a lighter color. Yeah. It's, 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 it's different. It's not like this, just an abundance of just regular fat. It's actually a pathological. Because it's under so much material. pressure, do you think? There's like less blood supply that it's a little clearer? It might, be, it might be the blood supply. It might be just the, uh, the way it's formed. I, I don't know. Under but, pressure? But it certainly is very interesting. And what's nice about it is that it kind of dissects this plane. This guy had some disc disease and some anterior compression, but it was really concentric because of the lipomatosis. So by relieving the lipomatosis, by, by just, all you do is it kind of just, you kind of just like separate it uh, and then just sort of suck it out, essentially, the fat, yeah. or you just kind of... Well, we sent we sent some specimen it. to the pathologist to make sure that there's nothing else going on, but it looked like regular looked like lipoma. like just regular lipomatosis. And, uh, and, and the biopsy came back as being uh, just regular lipoma. There was no, no, nothing malignant about it or anything bad like that. But once that fat was removed, his canal was very open and very wide and was very easy to con- proceed just to make sure the, n- the nerve root takeoffs were free. And... Uh, and we did that. And he felt dramatically better that day. I mean, he was walking uh, 400 feet the day of the operation, which is pretty fantastic for somebody who was having trouble walking even 100 feet before the operation. So uh, I think we, I think you achieved your, we achieved our goal of decompressing him. Yeah, that was an interesting case we, we had done. And, um, you know, basically uh, um, we see all kinds of interesting things, not just pure arthritis, but other conditions too. be other extradural masses like neurofibromas, we talked about synovial cysts that you often see with um We had a synovial cyst the other day. We actually did a lady that uh, I, th- I think uh, did very she did, well. She had a this. spondylolisthesis, and, and because of that, she did, developed, a, like you said before, she was trying to auto-stabilize, and in that process developed a cyst around the uh, L4-5 facet joint. The body that, likes to form cysts. That was causing compression. So we excised the cyst. Again, we sent that cyst to uh, pathology as well. Uh, and it was, it's, it's, not a, it's not a precancerous lesion or anything like that. It does not turn into malignant. I think these cysts, you know, these people in general are obsessed with their cysts. They, they, they hear they have a cyst, and they, that's the only thing they can think about. And th- this, I think what happens is that, you know, I, I've sort of, I'm interested in this. I've read about this. Um, I think the reason why people get the synovial cysts is because there's some separation of the joint, begin with that starts this process to allow the synovium to be exposed. It's diastatic, the joint. It's, it spreads w- wider. It spreads wider, and I think that allows the cyst to form. So it fills up with synovial fluid like it does in the knee joint or other joints. But it, but it, but and it, it's, it has, it's still encased in a membrane. But it forms outside the joint because yep. it's now separated, and the cyst still has a connection. So... It forms like this jelly material inside. It's not like a balloon. Sometimes you can send it to a pain specialist. They can try to pop that cyst. They love trying to do that, but I find that they oftentimes are unsuccessful. Success rate's not at always guaranteed. Because they're not try. really liquidy. In, in my experience, they're like the... They, 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 they can jelly almost. They're like jelly, and you don't have to get every morsel of the cyst either to, to, to basically yield a good effect from the, uh, from the actual decompression. It sort of comes with the actual thickened ligament. It becomes part of your decompression. Yes. So when we get these cysts, they sometimes will even look like a little pearl. They're coming off usually from 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 more anterior, and they're compressing the nerve root. If it's yes. an L4-5, it's oftentimes compressing the descending L5 nerve root. That's right. So you got to sort of separate these cysts, and sometimes they leak fluid. And it's scary initially when they leak fluid because you think, oh, I got a CSF leak, but it's actually not. It's a fluid from the synovial cyst. It's really thicker, yeah. We're always happy to, to know that when we discover that. And uh, these things are particularly um, nasty to patients because they're coming more posterior versus anterior like a disc. So they are, they're affecting the sensory fibers more or less, and they can be very painful. They can mimic a, a, a disc herniation in terms of the pain syndrome. Yeah, that's like that. Well, absolutely. They're causing compression on a specific nerve root, and that's why sometimes, you know, somebody with a spondylolisthesis will have more pain on one side than the other, and it, and it could be attributable to that cyst. 
um, and there's more neurological compression on that side. We decompressed her. Um, we got her L5 nerve was very nicely decompressed um, because we were going to we were going to fuse her. We knew because she had the spondy, spondylolisthesis. We we were very generous about removing joints material, uh, the joint processes to really widely decompress her because we knew we were putting in screws and bone graft material to fuse her. Yeah, so if you remove over 50% of the facet joint, you've created iatrogenic instability. And then right. and those patients, we generally will like to screw. But we knew beforehand- We that, knew we were going to put the that, screws that, that in. she, you know, especially with the, with the cyst and the severe stenosis on top of the spondylolisthesis, she was almost definitely going to need that, those screws anyway. So we could take- so we could really widely decompress these patients. We could widely decompress these patients with impunity because we know we're putting in the screws. Yeah. And we put the screws and everything went very nicely. Um, I think the case one took an hour, an hour and a half. It was very quick. Very quick. And she's doing great. She's doing awesome. Very she's satisfying doing. kind of cases, those synovial yeah. cysts. Yeah, because, you know, it's like a disc herniation. When you operate on a patient with disc herniation, their leg pain's gone immediately. Yep. And same with her. She, her leg pain was gone immediately. So she's very, very happy. She also was walking quite a bit the day of the operation, and, and uh, she's doing outstanding. The key is to get them mobilized after surgery to prevent blood clots. In get them legs. up and moving. Do you, do you, um, how else do you minimize blood clots? Um, well, we give uh, patients, the, starting usually the next day, uh, a blood thinner uh, injection. Right, we give them Lovenox. Lovenox, uh, which is sort of like a more modern sub-Q heparin kind of thing. It's a low molecular weight heparin, and we also give them... Sequential compression devices. Sequential de- it squeezes their calves. Exactly. And it, and While they're laying in more, bed. It causes the blood to flow backward, to, to flow back. But really the key is getting up and moving right away. Right away. So but we start, we, at, at NYU, we start them up and moving the day of the operation. But we have a protocol where we always put the patient on blood thinners the next day. And it doesn't cause, you know, there's been nothing that's proven that it causes more increased bleeding or hematoma. Well, we have drains in the back. We have drains, so we have, insur- you know, basically we're sh- pretty much assured that we're going to take care of any excess ooze, but the risk of a pulmonary embolism is, is, a, is a heck of a lot higher uh, uh, or a much more dangerous situation than some excess blood that's being removed by a drain. Right. That's not going to kill you. That's not going to kill, kill you. Exactly. So it's more important to basically prevent that and uh, Sure, all the safety measures to and, and the early loss. mobilization is the key. So we have a very, um, we have a very, you know, in the hospitals we work at, we have some pretty aggressive physical therapy uh, teams that really get the patients mobilized. I'm yeah, thinking. and they're excellent. That's important. I think that is is, is critical. Um, so, and I think the physical therapists appreciate that we do quick, good, quick work, and we can get them up and moving the day of the operation, which uh, which is a which is a boon to the hospital. Gets them up and moving earlier. Gets them home earlier. Hospitals every, want every, patients every, every, out of the hospital. Every, everybody's happy, especially the patients. So I think the, those have been some very interesting cases we've done. Um, so I think the next time we'll have some more discussion and maybe we'll have a few more uh, props. Some special guests. And special guests. Uh, what do you think? We'll, we'll, yeah, it's a good idea. Maybe we start with the plastic surgeon. Yeah, we'll talk about the plastic surgeon because he's sort of part of our team for a yeah, long time. We like him. And he gets, you know, and he gets some uh, other perks sometimes the patients need a little nip and tuck somewhere, and they sometimes get uh, get some service uh, that way too. You know, a lot of times when I'll tell a patient we're going to have a plastic surgeon there, they often ask, "Can they do my liposuction?" Right, exactly. Or, uh, and they have. And and, they have, and they I have. say, "Well, he's not going to do it at the time of the operation, but you can talk to him later. And if you like the results of the back surgery, then um, right, they want their liposuction at the same time as the back surgery. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's <laughs> or they just want just... their breast reduction at the same time. That's not going to work. They're in a different position. Different position, right? <laughs> but um, yeah, we'll talk to him next time. All right, Spine Bro. Good job. Good session.